Today, September the 6th, the year 2020. And oh, what a year it's been. A lot different than what a year normally is. But then again, we're blessed by the Almighty. Let us say, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. All right. Welcome to the Kingsley Terrace Church of Christ streaming services, streaming live from 2031 East 30th Street. Today is a day that the Lord has made, and we certainly are going to rejoice in it. For as children of the King, this is a day in which we worship God. But this is a special day because we worship Him every day. But as the corporate body of the Kingsley Terrace Church of Christ, we are prevented from publicly assembling, but spiritually we are together. And now, let us lift up, let us go to God in prayer as we prepare for our worship service. Our Father and our God, it is truly, Lord, we uh, thank you for blessing us with another day unlike any other. For this day is a day in which we worship you, Lord, in spirit and in truth. We're so thankful, Father, that you uh, gave us another day of your mercy and your grace. And Father, we as we prepare our hearts and minds to worship you, Lord, we pray, Father, that you get the glory and the honor. And as children of yours, as I say, Lord, we're so thankful for all that you've done, for all that you're doing and all that you will do, for our hope lies in your Son and our Savior, Christ Jesus. Now, let us prepare to lift up our voice in song as we prepare our worship service. It is in your Son, Jesus' name we pray. Let's all say amen. 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 Coming to us now, live, Brother Eric Harris, to lift us up in praise. Good morning, my brothers and sisters, and all those out there. We used to say all those out there in TV land, but I guess that ain't happening anymore. So all those out there in streaming land, let's get ready to praise our heavenly Father. I mean, it's been a it's been a pretty trying week, but I'm happy to be here. So our first selection will be "Sing and Be Happy" 653. Sing and be happy. Y'all ready to praise the Lord? Amen. Yeah. All right. Now, as Brother Dexter always say, thumbs up, uh, uh, like, love, and all that good stuff. <laughs> so, 653. All right. If the skies above you are gray, you are feeling so blue. If your cares and burdens seem gray all the whole day through, there's a silver light in the heavenly land look by faith and see it my friend trust in his promises grand sing and you'll be happy today lips along to the goal trust in him who he is keeping your soul let the world know where you belong look to jesus and pray be happy today often we are troubled and tired sick with sorrow and pain there are others living in sin blessed with earthly gain take new courage we cannot tell what the morrow may bring when the dark clouds vanish away then your heart truly can sing Sing and you'll be happy today. Press along to the goal. Trust in Him who leadeth the way. He is keeping your soul. Let the world know where you belong. Look to Jesus and pray. Lift your voice and praise Him in song. Sing and be happy today. 
Off we fail to see the rainbow up in heaven's fair sky. When it seems the fortunes of earth frown and pass us by, there are things we know that are worth more than silver and gold. If we hope and trust in each day, we shall have pleasures untold. Sing and you'll be happy today. Press along to the goal. Trust in him who leadeth the way. He is keeping your soul. Let the world know where you belong. Look to Jesus and pray. Lift your voice and praise him in song. Sing and be happy today. Press along to the goal. Trust in him who leadeth the way. He is keeping your soul. Let the world know where you belong. Look to Jesus and pray. Lift your voice and praise him in song. Sing and be happy today. Okay, our next selection will be 668. And I hope all those at home singing with us, sing with us, 668. Our God, he is alive. There is beyond the azure blue a God concealed from human sight. He tinted skies with heavenly hue and framed the world with his great might. There is a God, he is alive. In him we live and we survive. From dust our God created man. set men free and evermore with him could live. There is a God, he is alive, in him we live and we survive. From the our God created man. verses 5 and 15. And we're, we're also going to be reading from Ephesians chapter, chapter 2 verse 10. And that 
That's Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. Reading from Genesis first, it reads, Now no shrub had yet appeared on earth, and no plant had yet sprung up. For the Lord God had not sent rain on the earth, and there was no one to work the ground. Verse 15. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10 reads, For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Amen. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Let's pray. This morning, our precious Heavenly Father, we come to you in prayer saying thank you, Lord. Thank you for what all you have done for us, Heavenly Amen. Father. Lord, we ask you to watch over the sick and shut in, men, women, boys, and girls behind prison wall, Heavenly Father. Lord, we ask you to watch over and strengthen the bereaved family, dear God. Lord, we ask you to just protect us what's going on in the world today, Amen. Heavenly Father. We need you, God. We need you right now, Lord. Lord, we ask you to Watch over our kids and grandkids, dear yeah. Heavenly Father. Please protect them, Heavenly Father. Lord, I ask you for a special blessing on my sister, Heavenly Father. Lord, we ask, I ask you just to keep watching over her, Heavenly Father. She come a long way, but she still got a long way to go, Heavenly Father. Lord, I ask you just to strengthen her. Forgive us for all of our sins and wrongdoing, Heavenly yeah, Father. Lord. Please, Lord, I ask these blessings in your name, I pray. Amen. 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 morning saints it's time now for for us to turn our minds to the communion scriptures remind us that we are to remember the death burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ he came and bled and died on on this earth for our sins that great gift could never be matched today it's the greatest gift that was ever given and God gave it to us, giving each of us a chance at the tree of life. Each of you has a cup that represents the shed blood of our dear Lord Jesus on that cruel cross of Calvary. Bread represents his body that was broken for us. We do this on each Lord's day to remember that great sacrifice. Scriptures remind us always to keep this great gift in mind. And with that, let's pray. Our great Heavenly Father, it's once again we approach your throne thanking you for all the things you've done for us, especially that great gift that you gave for us on our behalf so many years ago. We remember and we reverence that gift each Lord's Day, just like the scripts, scriptures tell us to do. We thank you for this gift and we thank you for the opportunity that is ours. We ask these blessings in Jesus' name, amen. amen. At last stand here, my Savior, please, and bid my sovereign life. Would he devote that sacred head for such a
That communion that we just took is an integral part of our, of our worship to God each Lord's Day. We do it in remembrance of that great gift. The next portion of our service is giving. Just like the communion, scriptures are replete with examples of giving. Scriptures like, it's better to give than to receive. The more you give, the more you receive. Remind us that we are, we are to give. How much we are to give is between you and God. Leadership here at Kingsley Terrace are not the giving police. We're not the offering police. We make sure that you understand and know what scriptures say. We only remind you to do what the Lord says do. We are to give because God gave. And this is our opportunity to give back to him a portion of what he so richly bestowed upon us. Pray with me, please. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, it's time now for us to give back to you a little bit of what you've given us. You so richly blessed us since the beginning, and you have promised to be with us through the end. Our job is to use these gifts that you've given us, that is the funds, the resources, the jobs, the effort, the love, all these things that, that you bestowed upon us, give back a portion to you for your work in this place at this time. Be with leadership here at Kingsley Terrace that we can use these funds efficiently and effectively for your service. We ask these blessings in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hello again, hello again. Uh, <clears throat> before Brother Hubbard comes up and gives us a word from the word, we want to turn to page 561. 561, it's an old song. I mean, I love the song. It just, you know, when you reflect back and think of your life and think how, where God brought you from, and you just say to yourself, now that you have a good relationship with the Lord, is it well with my soul? All right. Ain't nothing like being well with the Savior. So I love this song, It Is Well With My Soul. But as you guys know, I can make a joyful noise, but I'm going to need the help of everybody. So we right. turn to page 561. It is well with my soul. When peace like a river attempted my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say.
they do indeed endure forever. We thank you, Brother Harris, for directing our thoughts, our hearts, and song. And I pray that you're appreciating how God has kept you in his care, has blessed you, and even to this present moment has molded you and kept you safe and secure. We, we do thank him for his goodness, his mercy. We do want to begin with the word of prayer. We want to welcome you to our program of the Kings of Terrace Church of Christ, the church where God is glorified, saints are sanctified, and our lives are changed. We thank him for his mercy and do invite you when there's an opportunity to come be with us in the presence of the Lord. <clears throat> Matter of fact, on next Sunday, we'll be having a service again here at our facility outside. Uh, we're still making sure we're taking extra precautions to keep everyone secure and safe. The uh, Lord blessed us two weeks ago to have a service collectively together out in the parking lot area. What a great time we had together. And do want to encourage you, come out on next Sunday. The service will begin at 10 a.m. outside in our parking lot. We do look forward to having you to come and to share with us uh, in that great endeavor. We do want to begin, however, with a brief, brief word of prayer. A special prayer request we have for the Dexter Smith uh, is traveling him and his wife, Natalie, are taking her, her parents back to uh, Texas and also uh, checking on his mother. His mother, Tessie, actually had a procedure uh, this past week. We're praying consistently for her. We thank God for what we heard so far, the success of the procedure on her behalf. We want to be keeping her and the Smith family uh, in our prayers. Again, keeping Brother LaShore's family in our prayers. Sister uh, uh, Crystal Lowe's grandmother also uh, lost her this past week, praying for that family. And um, we just want to thank God for what he's done to bring us this far. And keep my family in your prayers. We're thankful that my daughter and son-in-law were able to make it here safely to visit with us. Uh, they rapidly came through, uh, slowed down their vehicle, and pushed four kids out. And so we have uh, beautiful grandkids with us for uh, for this uh, this next week. And we thank God for that. And I want to just commend my wife because she is a super grandmother. She is uh, uh, she took those kids, and, and I've had a break. Praise the Lord. So I am thankful uh, for her, and uh, but good to have them here. And we just pray for our time uh, is one that we can actually survive. A 16, 10, 9, and six year old in the house. It's a whole lot louder than it normally is. So we just thank him for his grace and for his mercy. Let's go to God together for a brief word of prayer. Father God, we come to you in acknowledgement of your authority and your goodness, your peace, your grace, that you do indeed endure forever. You touch us, you keep us so close to you. You, you consistently bless us and mold us. And we, we are nowhere near, uh, nowhere near worthy of your goodness and your grace but because you stamped your image in us you love us in spite of ourselves. We pray special travel for the Smith family. Pray for Brother Dexter's mother as she is going through a path of recovery. Pray for those who've had losses in their family, for those who are traveling back and forth over this holiday season. Pray for protection of health and strength. Pray for wisdom in not taking any unnecessary chances and ask you to each one, Father, as you direct us and strengthen us May we see your hand working every step in our path as you seek to mold us to become better and greater children for you. Again, we thank you for your kindness and pray for all those who hear this program. May a word be said to draw them closer to bond and a beautiful connection with you. In the name of the one who loves us and gives us mercy, it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. We do want to be keeping you also in mind, as we mentioned, uh, the service on next Sunday here at our location. But do want to mention that the last Sunday of the month uh, at 3.30 in the evening at 3202 East 42nd Street, the Holy Street Church and Evolved Ministry are hosting a Praise Him in the midst of a pandemic. They're planning to do some things to school over there on 42nd Street. We want to encourage you to come out and share in that endeavor, being careful and cautious and celebrating what they're trying to achieve in the future, as well as to mention to you in passing that in November, there's going to be a revival we're taking place here in the city, a virtual revival to encourage you to join in and listen to us and share in sermons from those guys across the city who preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you'll be finding inside your Bible, the book of Genesis uh, and Ephesians, you won't be lost in our time together on this morning. This is a holiday weekend known as Labor Day. And you may wonder why it's even called Labor Day. Well, in the late 1800s in this country, in the United States, people working about 70 hours a week 
the average work week schedule is about 70 hours a week. And this, this weekend, the first Monday in September, uh, is seen as the last weekend of summer. But it's also uh, Labor Day is there to set the sense of, uh, it was intended to unify uh, union workers and to and reduce work time. Uh, actually, part of the idea was to get people to stop working so long and instead uh, give them a chance to spend some money. So the idea was to create a consumer emphasis by setting this date in this late 1800s when this action was established as a, as a national holiday. When you think about it beyond the idea of the Labor Day weekend and, and actually the, the holiday, most people see work, they see work or labor as some kind of a curse. Uh, some folk believe that uh, uh, I owe, I owe, it is off to work, I go. They have a perception that somehow that all labor, all work is somehow that God cursed man and the curse God put upon man is that man is going to have to work. Well, I want you to realize biblically that's actually not true. Work was never a curse put upon upon man. God works and, and there's something, but I want you to be able to look at the idea The God who we serve made all things out of nothing. The Bible suggests that he spoke out of nothing. God could create something out of nothing. But he has made us in his image and that he has stamped his nature and character and his image inside of us. And by doing that, he therefore gives us the capacity to take what's here and make out of what's here what others may not even see that's laid up in here. Let me, let me suggest to you also the idea that in all of your life, there are three basic views, approaches you're going to take for life and everything that your hands are engaged in. A person went to three infant quad surgeons and asked all three of them the same question. They asked them, what do you do? To one part served and he said, well, sir, answer me. I hear, well, what is it that you do with your life? And the guy said, I am a heart surgeon. That's who I am, and, and that's what I do. Who the second person said, well, sir, I'm going to ask you, who are you? And what is it that you do? The guy said, well, I, I, I work on hearts. I'm a heart surgeon. And really, that's just how I make my living. My, my, my goal in life is to travel and to pay for bills and to cover the expense of my family, but really, in all honesty, in all honesty, heart surgery is how I make my living, living my life. There was a third man and asked him, so what do you do? He said, my heart surgeon, I save people's lives. I want you to realize it is not what you do that makes the determination. It's how you view what you're doing. It's how you understand the reason God has given you a task to perform in the context of what you're living in. Do you do what you do in your life to make a paycheck? Or do you do what you do in your life because it's the only thing that you know how to do? Or do you see the bigger picture in life that what you do is supposed to make an impact and a stamp in the world that you live in that can't be removed even when you're dead? Amen. You've got to see your life from the right perspective. And let me share the initial idea that the work was never a curse given to man. And the book of Genesis, in the chapter just number three, uh, the writer says, verse 17, to Adam, God says to Adam, after Adam's sin, he said, because you listened to your wife. Let me read that again. Go ahead, bro. Because you listened <laughs> to your wife and ate from the fruit of the tree, of which I commanded you, you must not eat from it. First of all, let me declare something. For way too long, men have said it's a woman's fault. It's her fault. Stop getting messed up. Mm -hmm. Man was made first. God says to Adam, beside the steps, you listen. You made a choice. You were not tricked. You were, she was tricked, the Bible says. She was given this says, for this woman did. The woman was deceived. The woman was tricked. Adam was not tricked. Adam was not deceived. She was fooled and taken the fruit. Adam, flat-footed, open-eyed, walked up in there and said, I'm going to do what she suggested because she already messed up. I want you to stand up for that you can't blame a woman for a decision a grown man has actually made. That's right. And so don't say, well, you know, that the woman messed up. No, the woman made a bad decision, but her choice.
So what God does, he makes sure man was here before he allowed the plants to come, before he allowed the herbs to come, before he allowed the water to come, which tells you that God makes sure before a work gets started, he got somebody here already to complete the work. You and I are here to achieve a goal that God has left us here to do. Notice the Bible in Genesis chapter 2, verse 15, the writer says, and the Lord God, he takes man. First of all, the Bible says God yet saw us man, Genesis 2, verse 7. He takes man man he falls man from the dust he blows his breath into the dust when God blows his breath into the dust all of a sudden this dust becomes a living soul a living being this living soul now is taken from he first of all he takes dust he pours his he blows his breath into the dust the dust now has a form of life he takes that dusty piece of uh, the, he takes that dusty soul and puts the dusty soul in a place called Eden what's Eden Eden is a place of God Eden is a place you gotta be in you will never be a man and never be a woman and never be what you're called to be until you find yourself in the presence of the one that made you until you find yourself in the presence of God he takes mankind he placed mankind inside the garden the garden is the presence of God and the Bible says he puts them there to tend and keep it he puts man there to work because you will never find your value until you find your work oh I, you may say i know folks who feel they got their value they, they, they draw dealers and they think that's their value that, that's their that's the wrong kind of work but they are working right. i want you to realize the fact of the matter is that god made you for the purpose of working but this blows my mind and please ask these one and nine says this, and there's nothing new under the sun. What, what's, what's Solomon trying to express? He said, is there anything of which he may be said, see this is new, it's already been an ancient time before us. It blows my mind that even on our day, and I, I can, and I may, I may be about to date myself, but I was telling my granddaughter this morning that there was a period of time in life before there was actually no cell phones. Yeah, there's a period of life when there was no cell phones at all. Uh, uh, I, I'm amazed. I'm amazed at the world that we live in, in all the technology that exists. I can speak here in, inside this room uh, with you, with you, and we can have people. We do have people from all around the world who tune in to participate in this program. We can actually, I can stand here and, and the temperature outside is irrelevant. It can be hot in here or cold in here based on the setting that we make. But everything we have access to are the same raw materials that God initially put here on this earth. Even this, this iPad that I have or my soul phone that I, I have over there or our capacity to be online and shoot information across the airways all around the world. All this stuff, none of this stuff is new. None of this, I don't care what new technology they come up with in a year, what new product somebody develops inside of a year from now. There are no new elements inside this world. All you have in this world are rocks and rivers and lakes, rocks and water and trees and grass and minerals. The, what, what man has been able to do, and here's your work, is to take the raw material that already exists and create all the things that you can actually see. God let this creation to man to unlock the untapped resources and the untapped potential of the world he left here for us. And because of what God, the creator of all things can do, he can allow somebody to gain an insight. So now I can jump inside of an airplane and fly all the way across the world and sit inside somebody's room because of man's capacity to take what God has created and left for man, the core nature of principles that exist inside this world. There are spaceships and there are cell phones and there's computers and, and man working. I can actually stand here and pick up a cell phone and call a friend in Japan and talk to them while sitting at my kitchen table. All because God stamped his breath inside of man and gave you the ability to create your sense of work. God gave work to you and he gives you and your work as a gift to the world that you live in. So, so the key here 
It's not a question of why does work exist. It's the question of what is your work, and your work may not be your job. Work is more than your job. It's the plan. It's the reason why God left you here. God has been so good to me. I, I've been preaching for over 30 some years. And, 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 and when I first started preaching, I, I think they gave me $20 a week. It wasn't because it was that long ago. It's because that's all they had to give. <laughs> I recall traveling an hour and a half to go preach from Port Arthur, Texas, uh, all the we drove all the way to Silvery, Texas, and to for an hour and a half to preach to three people. And and I don't think they gave us anything when they had three people there. There's enough money for three people there and us just to get the lights on. But you see, that was not that was my work. When you're doing the thing that God has made you to do, it doesn't matter if you get paid. I have told the church here this, and I believe this because I know this all my reality of my life. I, I, I don't do what I do to get paid for it. I would do what I do without getting paid. Now, somebody will pay me, but the point is the idea that I don't do it for the purpose of a check. And all I'm declaring to you, every person who God has allowed to exist is key to realize your life is about something bigger than, greater than, and mightier than the paycheck you work for, the child of God who belongs to the Lord, may realize there are things in this world I need to learn the value of living for that's worth more than the idea of getting a paycheck. John Lewis died not long ago. He didn't do the stuff that got him beat up and bumped upside the head for a paycheck. It's because he understood, I've got a purpose bigger than that. Martin Luther King put his life on the line. Why? Because he didn't pay? No. He understood there's something bigger in life than the idea of just doing something for a paycheck. You gotta learn the value of finding why am I here? You gotta look for that purpose in life that God allowed you to have. It's because God has allowed you to be here for something bigger than and greater than and more mightier than any paycheck, any amount of money. It's not about those things. So it's because of this idea, Ephesians chapter 4, and the writer says this here in chapter 4, verse 1, he establishes. Paul said, I'm a, as a prisoner of the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. He said, I want to challenge you to live your life worthy of your calling. The terminology inside the King James Version uses the term of the vocation for which you are called. That word means a strong feeling of suitability for a particular, a particular career. This is God's personal and purposeful call for your life. I would establish for you, you've not begun to live until you identify why God has you here. But there's some, and bless their hearts, who, who can serve people who are sick. Uh, I, 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 I'm, not, I'm not one of those. I was talking to them recently and they shared with me some kind of a procedure they had and talking about, uh, about the procedure, some, some kind of a cutting they had to go through it. And, and I'm, I'm listening and talking to them and while they're telling me about all they went through, I'm cringing inside. Oh, I, 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 can, I can feel your pain sitting here talking to you. I, I, I don't want to see it. I don't want to touch it. But I can feel it with you because that ain't my gift. But there's some people, you walk inside of a room and you're laying there and they say, I'm here to serve you. I, I, will, I will bathe you. I will change you. I will care for you. That, that, that's a gift. That's a gift. There's some folk who can sit down with you in the midst of your hurt and your pain and they can give you counsel and direction and they will share with you in the midst of the difficulty of life. That, that's a gift God gives. Some people have the capacity of leadership. It's the gift of leadership and the capacity to lead is the ability to see people where they are and help them see the next set of steps. Whatever the gift is that God has gifted everyone with a capacity, it's the vocation by which you are called. This is God's personal and purposeful call in your life. Your work connects you to your purpose. It identifies for you the reason that God allowed you to be here. It is the calling of God on your life to be used by him for him. And when you find yourself doing those things, you, you feel like 
It's a gift to give it. You walk away being fulfilled because your calling is your life work to be done with joy, with frustration, with hurt, with pain, with energy. Even those who work with those who are, who are in prison is a gift. Those who work with those who are homeless is a gift. Those who have the compassion to, to feel others in their pain is a gift. It's the willingness to say, I'm willing to give myself for somebody else to make them better and draw them closer to the wonderful living and great God that we serve. A calling he says, he, I call, tell you about your calling. A calling, a calling requires a caller. God puts you where he wants you to be. And even right now in your life, I want to challenge you. Stop looking at life as a chance to vacation, a chance to retire, a chance to sit back at home and watch the grass grow. Look at your life from the perspective of what am I here to do? Paul says something so powerful in Ephesians 2, verse number 10. He said, for we, you all of us, we are God's handiwork or his workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. He, the word, the word uh, in this text, handiwork or workmanship, is from the Greek word poimeo. And poimeo is the word we get our word poem from. You are God's masterpiece. You are important and significant. You are valuable in the eyes of God because you do not see because you do not see the you God sees does not mean that God is wrong about what he sees inside of you. You were created in God's image and God makes no mistakes to put yourself down for the way you are is to dismiss and insult God, the work he planned to do in your life. And instead of what do I want to do in the world? The real question is, who am I? Who has God made me to be? And what does God want to use me in the world to achieve that will give him glory? Friend, when you start asking that kind of question, it'll transform your concept of work. It don't matter how much money you make in the context of your life, because when you die here, nobody's going to recall all that stuff. Many multi, matter of fact, we can call out people who've been multi-billionaires, and you have no idea. Who, you don't know who, many of you don't know who DuPont is, or, 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 or guys who, were, who, made, who at one point, there were three men in the world who owned most of the money inside the world. You don't know, and you don't even care. But what you will know and care about the lives that God lets you touch in the time that you live here. Your work is the reason why you live. And if you choose, if you choose to build your life on a purpose, you begin to discover why God has allowed you to be here. When God sees you doing your part, developing what he's given to you, then you will do his part and open doors that no man can shut. He will open doors that nobody can close. When you start the initiative saying, Lord, here am I, send me. And that's what Isaiah said. He's Lord said, Lord, who shall we send? Isaiah said, I don't know me. Here am I, send me. And he'll be up to this. How do you find your spot? How do you find the gift that God has given you? How will you discover the purpose of your life? Here's how you do that. Every time there's a chance to do something that God would want you to do, do it. You will discover yourself being right where he wants you to be. You don't find your purpose. Your purpose finds you. Yeah. As you walk about letting God use you for something bigger than, better than, and greater than yourself. If your agenda in life is folk to pat you on the back, you won't find it. If your agenda in life is supposed to brag on you, yeah, well, guess what they did? You won't find it. You won't discover the reason that you're here until you stop focusing on yourself and start focusing on how can I be used to serve the world I'm living in? When you seek the answer to that, you'll discover the answer to your own existence. That God 
has left you here for something bigger than, better than, and greater than anything you can possibly imagine. As I close, I recall a I preached in Alabama for, for six years, and, and while there, I can recall explicitly an elderly lady, uh, and, and, and she was in a, a member of the church who was in the nursing home, and I would go to visit with her and talk to her, and I recall uh, when I would go to sit and talk with her, she would tell me, she said, I, she, I, she asked the church to pay for her to have a, a phone. This, this, is, this is before cell phones, so don't, don't. So she asked for her to have a, pay for a phone inside of her room, and, and we asked her why, do you want a phone in your room? Because she wanted to sit at that phone and she couldn't leave the nursing home. She couldn't drive. She, she couldn't walk. Or she could go possibly from her room to the lunchroom and from the lunchroom back to her room. But what she said, what I can do, what I can, I can pick up this phone. She said, I can call somebody and I can pray with somebody. I can call somebody and I can study with somebody. I can call somebody and I can encourage somebody. I can pick up this phone and I can do my work. Work. Don't think and suggest that somehow you got well when the pandemic is over, when all this stuff is over. I see what God got for me to do. What God has for you to do, a pandemic can't stop. Amen. It's about your level of surrender for something bigger than, better than, and greater than yourself. Until you choose that path, you will waste your time and waste your life with all the foolish, simple things that will occupy your time. As I close out, Paul wrote in Ephesians, he said, he said, he said, walk circumspectly, which means wisely. He says, he says, walk circumspectly which means wisely, he said, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Here's what that means. He said, he, Paul said, you got to learn how to live your life walking carefully and be aware of every step you wait. Wait, you make why? He said, because you're redeeming. The word redeem is to purchase. You're purchasing your time. Every second of your life you pay for it redeeming or purchasing your time wisely because the days are evil and that word evil the Greek has the idea because the days are mischievous what's Paul saying Paul saying if you don't plan how you're going to handle your time, dumb things will steal your time. What you do last year? Woo! I watched all these shows about uh, uh, reality TV, and I watched, ooh, this chick last year had a fight, cut somebody else out. They broke the whole mirror in the house. There was yelling, screaming, ooh, I just, I wish I was the whole year on dumb stuff that added nothing to my life. Do you not know in our world we live in right now, there's so much social media stuff out there. You can waste your life on junk and achieve nothing in life. And if you don't choose right now to pour your life into something that gives God glory, I don't care if you live to be 80 or 130 or 2. Your life is wasted if it doesn't give God some glory. Amen. You're working or just peddling and wasting time. I will pray for you. God has a reason he let you be here. There's a lot of times it's not for all the dumb stuff you're wasting your life on. But if I, I need more money, bless your heart, everybody want money. Yeah. But I want you to realize your life is not going to be determined based on the money in your pocket. When you learn the value of your life being poured into something bigger than yourself, you may have less, 
to be more fulfilled. In, in our world right now, there are folk with a whole lot of money showing up miserable. Matter of fact, we're in a world now where you have miserable rich people and happy, joyous poor folk. Because some folk have realized your life's value is not based on stuff. It's based on purpose. And your purpose is the work that you labor for to give God some glory. Amen. I, I don't know what your world is like right now. I do know this. If you're not careful, you'll waste time, life, and energy on things that'll just leave you empty. And I don't care who likes you, who thinks about you. I'm always, I'm always heartbroken when I look on the media and see young people who died doing nothing, doing something dumb, foolish. And I wonder, prayerfully, your parents had some wisdom. Because unfortunately, if your parents ain't got no sense, you ain't seen nobody act like they have to understand life has a purpose and a value. And you live in the foolishness of your experiences. If you live like a fool, you'll die like a fool. Or if you live with a purpose, it won't matter how long you live. Because the stamp you leave will last past your own lifetime. Friend, if you're not a part of the family of God, that's what you need. You cannot begin this step. You cannot begin this work. You cannot begin life without acknowledging that you gotta die to who you were and come alive to something bigger than, greater than, and mightier than yourself. And when you understand that, that's when life starts. Preacher, how do you do that? I'm glad you asked. Friend, it's so, it's so simple to be what you need to be that you would actually need help to misread it. The Bible says, Romans 10, 17, faith that saves comes from hearing the word of God. First of all, you got to hear what God said. Well, my pastor told me, well, I always heard what my, I just feel in my heart. No, you missed it. The Bible says, Romans 10, 17, Faith that saves comes from what you heard out of the word of God. If you can't find it here, don't trust it. Right. Once you acquire faith, the Bible says, without faith, it is impossible. Hebrews 11, verse number 6. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. For he that comes to God must believe that he is and that he can reward those who diligently seek him. you got to learn the value of seeking God first. And then the Bible says, Acts 17, verse 30, at one time God overlooked ignorance, but now he commands all men everywhere to repent. Repentance is a change of mind. It says no to sin and yes to God. It says no to my way. It says yes to God's way. You've heard the word of God. You believe what you've heard and have a change of mind. Friend, that'll make you have a great confession. Jesus said in Matthew 10, 32, if you don't confess me before men, I won't confess you before my Father which is in heaven. What's a confession? Confession has a duality to it. Confession says, I want Jesus to be my Savior. We all like that part. But confession also declares, I want him to become my Lord. I want him to become my curios. I want him to tell me what to do, where to do, and how to do it. That's what he is. And once you make that great confession, you do what the Bible says you must do. You got to die to your old life. You got to die to your old world. And Jesus said, Mark 16, 16, he that believe it and, and it's a conjunction, and is baptized shall be saved. What's a conjunction? Conjunction, junction, what's your function? Function of a conjunction, it joins two ideas together and you cannot have one without the other. Believe and be baptized. And when you do that, Acts 2.47 says, and the Lord himself will add you to his family. He'll add you to his church. The word church, ecclesia, is just called out from people. He will add you to all the people he's called out the world into a connection and a relationship with him. And when you do that, friend, you're now part of the family of God. You begin to discover the reason he has you here. If you've not done that, call us, contact us, send us a message on your Facebook account. Let's contact our, our, our YouTube, maybe merge with our YouTube, YouTube page and send a message to our website. We want to know how we can bless you and draw you closer that you might find the reason that God has allowed you to live 
and to be here even right now. Get to work, because God has got you here to achieve something bigger than, better than, and greater than yourself. Amen? Amen. May God bless you. Let's go to God together for a brief word of prayer. Father God, magnificent and merciful Father, your greatness endures forever. Your love is long-suffering. You give us time, you bless us with health and strength, and you, and you thank you can look at us and say, here is a reason I have you here. You pour into someone else, you bless someone else, and because you're here, there are people in this world who are blessed because of you. Thank you, Lord, for your love. Thank you for your care enough of us to use us when we're not even worthy to be used by you. Thank you because you see us with our brokenness, with our weakness, and our shortcomings, and our stumblings, and you touch us, you activate us, and you take your people who have so little to offer, and you take and do great work with some of us who are the least to be considered. Thank you for your love, your grace, your peace, your mercy, and I ask you to bless each one who hears this word. May they look at the work you've given us to do, and look at how you're right now trying to mold us and develop us and protect us and keep us. And for some of us, you poured us into people's lives because without that person there, we can't be what we need to be. Thank you. Thank you for your trust, your mercy, your grace, your continued peace, and the work you trust your children to achieve here. And now, in the name of the God who calms all waters. In the name of the God who calms every sea. In the name of the one who can speak a world into existence with just a word. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. 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 And may God bless you. May God bless you, keep you in his care, he protect you and give you strength again next Sunday. Come on out to 2031 East 30th Street here in Annapolis, right down the street from Keystone and 30th, across from Blackburn Terrace. You'll find us here. Come sit in the parking lot, enjoy the service together. We'll wave at you, we'll holler at you. Look forward to seeing your wonderful smiling face right here at 2031 East 30th Street next Sunday. May God bless you, may he protect you, may he keep you. Hold to God's unchanging hand and get to work. Be blessed.